Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank you for joining the Frame Mobility Visits Institute webinar lecture series. This is Evangelos Kaiser, Director of the Frame Mobility Research Institute, and today we have the pleasure to, uh, to hear from Dr. Uh, Jamie Padgett, who is going to present to us about resilience of intermodal transportation infrastructure at the multiple hazards. This session, uh, I'm very pleased to mention this, that is co-hosted by WTS FAU student chapter, and they are going to uh, and they are going to introduce the speaker and take questions in the end of the presentations. So Alini, as a president of the WTS FAU chapter, is going to give a little uh, talk a little bit more about the presenter. Alini. Thank you, Dr. Kaiser. Hello and welcome everyone to our webinar. I am Alini Machado, the president of the WTS FAU student chapter, and we will also have Valentina Facuzzi, our chapter's vice president, who will address all your questions in the end of this presentation. Dr. Jamie Paget is the chair and professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Rice University in Houston, Texas. Dr. Paget's research focuses on risk assessment of structures and infrastructure and the subsequent quantification of resilience and system stability in the face of multiple hazards. Her group develops methods to evaluate and mitigate the consequences of such hazards as hurricanes, earthquakes, and flooding, ranging from the individual stru structure to the infrastructure system to the community scale. She has published over 250 articles in journals or archive conference proceedings in the general area of structural response, reliability, resilience, and life cycle assessment. Thank you, Dr. Paget, and the floor is yours. Um, you are on mute, just a second. Thank you, Eleni, sorry about that. And thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, I truly appreciate the invitation uh, to speak um, with this group today um, and share some of our ongoing work um, that's both being done at Rice University as well as with some of our collaborators around the country, including our NIST Center of Excellence for Community Risk-Based Resilience Planning that I'll share a little more about today. I first want to um, just highlight some of the work that we do and the perspective that I'm coming from um, as I speak to the broader Freight Mobility Research Institute. Um, my background is in structural and civil engineering, and we have an interest in my group at quantifying the performance of structures and infrastructure systems across a portfolio or community scale. Um, and looking at the effects of earthquakes, hurricanes, flood events on the performance of these systems and better understanding some of those cascading consequences through the lens of sustainability or resilience. And a lot of the practical applications of some of these methods are conducted in the context of either transportation or energy and industrial infrastructure. Um, so we've been working on problems related to highway or railway bridges um, and related uh, networks, looking at industrial complexes with things like refineries or tanks that house hazardous materials at port structures and facilities, and in particular looking at methods that will allow us to assess hundreds or thousands of these types of systems at a regional scale or at a community scale. I want to acknowledge uh, my research group, and this is probably about a year or more old picture at this time, uh, pre-pandemic, but many of the group members remain or their work I'm uh, sharing and reflecting today, in particular, some of the work by um, Sushreo Misra and some earlier ongoing work by um, Annabel Tafur or Pranavesh uh, Penacal, um, along with some of our postdocs, uh, Yusuf Darastani um, or SM uh, Friends today. Well, we live in a multi-hazard world, and I, I appreciate this map that Cox put together looking at um, the dominant hazards per region based on um, exposure of roadway, roadway and railway assets. Um, but I think it serves to underscore the fact that 
regardless of where you live across the US or across the globe, um, we're plagued by challenges of designing, building, and maintaining infrastructure to withstand um, the effects of nature uh, and of our natural hazards. So I'm speaking to you today uh, from Rice University in Houston, Texas. Um, and in this map, you see that perhaps our dominant hazard uh, might tend to be risks from cyclones or hurricane events. But any, even in a single locale or even an individual hazard brings with it multi-hazard challenges. So a hurricane, for example, brings with it wind, surge, wave, rainfall, these concurrent hazards uh, that plague our infrastructure. Or in any location at a given time, you may have challenges of cascading hazard effects. For example, landslide uh, following earthquake ground shaking or debris that's generated from a storm event. So these complexities of concurrent or cascading multi-hazards um, are an ongoing challenge as well as an ongoing interest in, uh, in my research group. And I uh, just let, referenced this data from NOAA to underscore the challenges that we face. So taking a bit more of a US centric view, looking at um, this increase that we've seen in recent years with respect to the number uh, of billion dollar disaster events across the country, as well as those economic losses associated with these hazard events. Now, this can be attributed to a number of different facts, whether it be the shifting and uh, frequency or intensity uh, of hazard events, or the shifting and siting um, of the built urban environment. On the right-hand side, you see, for example, changes in global population exposure or changes in built environment exposure uh, to various types of hazards, reminding us that we continue to build in hazard-prone locations that are exposed to these multi-hazard events. And lastly, we see that we, are, we also cite particularly vulnerable infrastructure like transportation infrastructure uh, in these hazard prone locations. And this can have broad cascading consequences on our communities. And I picked just one example here from Hurricane Harvey uh, to underscore the importance uh, of transportation infrastructure resilience during and immediately after hazard events in this example. Um, so Hurricane Harvey hit Houston in 2017. Many of you uh, probably saw the media stories if you didn't happen to be in Houston like I was. Um, and you see the inundation to bridges and roadways. We had washout um, of some of these structures and systems. We also just simply had inundation that prevented travel and access to things like critical facilities or vulnerable populations. And that's essentially what's shown in the map at the right where some of our recent and ongoing work is looking at some of the issues of inequities surrounding the impacts um, of hazards on our infrastructure and on the populations that depend on them. Taking a, a, a bit of a, a higher view, looking not at say a single mode of transportation like the highway uh, bridge and roadway system that we looked at in Harvey, but considering the interactions that we have when we're looking at intermodal transport, we can have a broader appreciation of the cascading effects of these hazards on our communities. For example, significant potential to disrupt goods flow that may be travel traveling via intermodal transport and the challenges and complexity in mod modeling the interaction of these systems, as well as the diversity of components that span across systems such as ports, railways, and highway systems. We see just a few of the examples of past damage to railway tracks during earthquakes, collapsed bridge spans in these events, or damage to piers and wharfs from coastal multi-hazard events. So these can pose significant challenges to the built environment and have cascading consequences, including economic consequences from disruption of goods flow, among others. And this really leads us to some of the challenge that we set out to try to tackle in some of our work in terms of looking at general frameworks for modeling the resilience of some of these transportation 
assets during multi-hazard events. I'll talk to you today about not only that general framework, but first uh, a bit of a high level view of where our field is at in terms of developing key input models to these systems and some of the work that our group has done and contributing to that effort. And then we'll take a deep dive into two application examples. Uh, one is looking at resilience of intermodal transportation systems in a seismic zone and looking at the potential for disruption of goods flow. And the second is looking at the role of transportation infrastructure resilience and modeling broader community resilience and coupling physical and social systems when exposed to coastal multi-hazards. And we'll finish with a few uh, discussions of what I see as some ongoing challenges and future opportunities, especially for some of the current students or researchers in this field. So I've used that uh, perhaps buzzword uh, that's very common in our field these days, as well as in popular media, which is resilience. And I'll acknowledge the broad ranging definitions that you'll find in the literature when we're looking at resilience of infrastructure systems or of communities. But I do appreciate the state of the art review that Gasser presented, and I'm pulling this figure from some of their work uh, looking at uh, identifying typical resilience concepts and common themes that you'll find in much of this work, um, which is essentially looking at that idea that we're not looking at solely at a single snapshot in time during or following an event, but we're also looking at that temporal evolution of system performance. Now, what system performance might mean in different contexts certainly can vary. Um, perhaps it could be measures at the infrastructure component level, like traffic carrying capacity of a bridge, or perhaps it might be system services or broader community scale performance metrics, um, looking at things like access uh, of victims and critical facilities. This idea that we're preparing for, absorbing, recovering from, and adapting to a, adverse events is inherent to some of the national Academy's definition, but also quite common across many resilience modeling frameworks. And we use that as the context for um, some of our methodological development for looking at some of these single and coupled mode transportation um, models. Um, and I'm posing an example here from some of Sushreyo Misra's work as a part of our um, efforts in the NIST uh, Center for Community Resilience Planning. Um, where we're looking at resilience of intermodal transportation infrastructure. And this first example that I'm showing here, the framework is adapted to highway and railway networks that have the potential for goods exchange at intermodal terminals. And some of our ongoing work, um, Annabelle Tafour, who is a current um, PhD student in my group, is looking at adapting this to consider also the potential for waterway transport for looking at things like port resilience and um, adding that as a, a mode for these intermodal system models. Just to quickly walk through the framework, uh, the idea is that we first have a characterization of the hazard whether it be a single or multi-hazard event, and the IMs or the intensity measure of that event at our key locations of our infrastructure assets. Therein, our infrastructure inventory and characterization data is important. In my group, we spend a lot of time developing what we refer to as fragility models, or models that help us to assess the vulnerability of our built assets to these hazard intensities. In this case, looking at the potential for damage to highway network components, to intermodal terminal, terminals, or to railway network components, such as bridges uh, and railways. We then require models to help us to estimate not only the immediate post-event functionality or usability of these assets, but also their potential restoration of functionality based on repair activities uh, and recovery efforts through time. Uh, as a part of this effort, we look at network level performance. So as in addition to looking at individual bridges and segments of railways or roadways, looking at the overall network performance and how that evolves in time as we look at the demands on these networks 
as well as the recovery scheduling or the deployment of resources uh, for repairing some of those assets. And ultimately, you'll see either coupling of these types of models within a broader community resilience framework um, or looking at different indices or indicators of resilience, such as that temporal evolution of functionality or metrics that look at integrals uh, under these um, functionality curves. So uh, very briefly, just to point out some of those input models, we require characterization of the uncertain occurrence and intensity, as well as spatial distribution of these hazards to inform our resilience modeling. I show a few examples from some of our work or our work with collaborators in recent years, but the ideas uh, our field often leverages either physics-based models simulating the, the uh, uh, distribution of these intensities over time uh, during the hazard, such as the flood model that's shown on the left, or leverages statistical approximating functions like surrogate models that allow us to efficiently estimate these intensity measures across the region. And this is becoming increasingly attractive when we look to probabilistic modeling or risk-based analyses that require hundreds or thousands of simulations, and especially when we want to look at multi-hazard occurrence or these joint events. Um, that have, for example, combinations of wind, surge, and wave. In terms of uh, some of our exposure modeling, um, we spend a lot of perhaps unappreciated effort at uh, developing inventory data, um, either collecting, processing, or reverse engineering that data to characterize the built environment in terms of the location, for example, the structural type, um, information on repair replacement costs um, of these assets. And this just shows a few examples from some of our work in the Texas coast in Houston or in the greater Memphis area. I mentioned that we spend a lot of our efforts on fragility modeling coming from the structural reliability perspective. Um, and the idea is that these models are statements of a conditional failure probability uh, given an intensity measure of the hazard event. On the slide here on the bottom left, you see sort of the classic fragility curve where we're looking at exceeding some limit state or entering some level of damage. Um, this might be uh, things like cracking or spalling of concrete, or it may have direct ties to functionality or repair uh, that is needed. On the right, you see the, the shift um, that we have been helping to push uh, in previous years to move beyond our unidimensional fragility models, to what we refer to as parameterized fragility functions. And these types of models still are conditional failure probability statements, but they condition that damage on now a vector of intensity measures. This is especially important in the multi-hazard context, where, for example, we may look at, say, three-second gust wind speed along with a surge elevation and a vector X, which refers to characteristics of the structure or infrastructure assets. What this means is that we can um, perhaps move beyond some of our traditional approaches, which used archetype or representative structures to reflect a whole diverse portfolio, or avoid having to develop new models for every single structure across the region and allow us to have these um, efficient approximating functions that can tailor our damage estimates to individual structures based on some of those key characteristics in the vector X. Uh, I show one example form and we'll talk about some of that development uh, in the future slides. In terms of input fragility models, just at a high level, I want to note some of our uh, recent or past efforts in case um, you're interested in following up or I can share some related papers. I'll show an example today where we've leveraged uh, new railway bridge fragility models that we've developed under seismic loads, trying to address current gaps uh, in the literature. Um, we've seen relatively little attention placed on some of our coastal transportation assets uh, where we um, developed new roadway fragility models considering storm effects um, like um, inundation duration from coastal surge. Uh, 
Um, there's been quite a bit of effort over the last couple of decades to develop seismic fragility models. <clears throat> Some of the notions that we have put forth is this idea of time-dependent fragility functions, meaning that we should reflect the fact that throughout the life um, of a structure or infrastructure, that we have the potential for aging or deterioration that may increase its vulnerability to hazard events and these interactions between chronic stressors like aging deterioration or environmental exposure and punctuated events like natural hazards should be reflected in our resilience modeling. Um, in the center, I show an example of a parameterized fragility model. This one particularly looks at um, how we can consider predictors like span length, number of spans, column heights under seismic loads, but we've had similar efforts for parameterized fragility modeling under coastal surge and wave loading as well. Um, and some of our more recent and ongoing work uh, with George Balomenos um, has looked at uh, port uh, facilities and looks, for example, at piers and wharves and compared fragility models for different design details or connection components. And these, again, are all key input to that larger vision of quantifying resilience of these systems. We require, in addition to predicting damage, the ability to look at repair and restoration. Um, and the plot that I show on this slide just shows a generic restoration function. So on the y-axis, our Q refers to some measure of, say, functionality or performance. You might think of this as being, say, traffic carrying capacity for a bridge. And on the x-axis, we look at the time dimension and how that functionality may evolve in time, including potential wait time for inspection or deployment of crews and resources, and then that temporal evolution. And it may be a simple step function or it may be a, a continuous uh, repair time function. Uh, just to acknowledge some of the existing work that's been ongoing in this area, um, Quite a while ago, during my PhD days, we proposed some initial stepwise uh, type functions for mapping damage to functionality. Um, some of the more recent work, for example, by Bocchini, is looking at different generic restoration functions that can be applied to transportation assets. Um, our recent work that I'll talk more about today is looking at um, leveraging decision trees, for example, to look at immediate post-event functionality based on combinations of component damages and also estimating the time for removal of restrictions like load restrictions, lane or speed restrictions. Beyond looking at damage and repair to individual assets, we're increasingly um, looking at regional network level performance and working at colleagues to better understand some of the impacts of this damage. Um, and many researchers in the field have been looking at different um, either algorithms or approaches for abstracting our network um, in terms of, for example, adjacency matrices based on graph theory where we look at removing nodes or links in that system if they're damaged um, during these hazard events as well as posing different types of formulations like multi-scale modeling if we wanna focus in particular on a region like Memphis, but understand that that transportation uh, infrastructure in Memphis is a part of a much broader regional or even nationwide uh, transportation system. Um, and other researchers are looking at things like decision support uh, from the perspective of how we prioritize inspections or how we look at deploying assets like repair crews and recovery resources uh, to optimize network performance. <clears throat> so all of these are key ingredients if we wanna be able to study the resilience of uh, single or intermodal transportation networks. And I wanna use one example from some of our recent and ongoing work um, in the Memphis Metropolitan Statistical Area. Uh, essentially that region <clears throat> that historically was uh, subjected to uh, the events uh, from the New Madrid seismic zone. So we're looking at seismic performance of this coupled rail and truck uh, intermodal system. Uh, and I mentioned that this is a part of some of our ongoing efforts in the NIST uh, COE. 
And so going back to our intermodal resilience analysis framework, I'll highlight some of our recent advances that support applying this framework in the seismic resilience context in an area like Memphis when we want to look at freight flow disruptions. Um, Sushreyo uh, recently published a paper uh, that looked at advancing the notion of parameterized fragility modeling, uh, as well as applying it specifically in the context of seismic vulnerability of railway bridges. And this is essentially an understudied asset that we really didn't have existing models to go out and adopt if we wanted to apply this broader concept in terms of predicting damage to regional portfolios of railway bridges that were typical in areas like Memphis. Um, so beyond um, better understanding the seismic performance uh, of these particular structures, uh, we also looked at how we could make uh, this parameterized fragility framework more efficient and portable across um, a regional portfolio. So I won't go into detail into the, uh, the flow chart of the framework, but part of the notion is this idea that we leverage finite element models of our bridge structures when subjected to earthquake ground motions in order to estimate the response under a whole range of different intensity measures of the hazard event and characteristics of the structure, uh, leveraging Latin hypercube sampling. But in order to make it more efficient for our reliability assessment, assessment we use seismic demand meta models, or we fit the statistical predictions of these bridge component responses, like the bearing response or the column response or abutment response, that would allow us to then simulate that hundreds or thousands of times in a reliability assessment. And in this case, uh, Sushreyo proposed the concept of using elastic nets um, as a part of our uh, regression for estimating this response. Uh, we also uh, leverage logistic regression for building uh, these parameterized fragilities, meaning that looking at things like slight damage at the component or system level could be informed by hazard intensity measures and details of those railway bridges, for example, column height, reinforcement ratio, and so forth. Um, and without going into too much detail, I'll just acknowledge some of the, the findings of that study. Um, I mentioned there weren't existing railway fragilities for typical um, railway bridges in the region, but there were recommendations that were kind of lingering in the literature. For example, let's use um, the most similar highway bridge fragility model as a proxy for the railway bridge vulnerability. And that's the comparison that you're seeing on this plot. Uh, the highway bridges in black and blue, and a comparison with our proposed fragilities in red, um, which suggests that indeed the differences in design of railway assets actually led them to typically be less vulnerable to earthquakes than their highway bridge counterpart. And we should reflect that in our regional intermodal resilience modeling framework. We also were left with a dearth of information to predict the post-event functionality and repair or restoration of a lot of the assets that are typical in intermodal systems. Um, where we could, we leveraged empirical data, meaning past damage and repair data that we could obtain from reconnaissance or reports or from DOTs. Um, but I think there's still a real opportunity to continue to collect and amass this type of empirical data. Um, what we set out to do was to try to supplement that with expert opinion data. Um, so we conducted a, a survey to go after information like closure decisions, repairs, and their duration based on presenting different levels of component damage or combinations of those component damage. And we looked at assets like roads, railway tracks, highway and railway bridges, and the failure modes that actually would be observed not only during earthquake events, but other multi-hazard events. Uh, that led to an effort to build models, not only of closure decisions. For example, if you were to see a certain level of damage to bearings and to columns or abutments, what would be the probability of closure of that structure? And we built those uh, leveraging decision trees 
um, because they're relatively simple and interpretable. Um, and we use training data from our empirical and survey data. <clears throat> but we also wanted to know the times, the time to removal of restriction um, and how long we might expect to have that loss of functionality or reduced functionality of these assets. And in this case, um, we did perform some clustering on our data um, to develop separate models in each cluster and have reduced variance and improved predictive quality of our models. And in this case, uh, leverage rain and forest, which essentially uh, is similar to the decision tree concept, but it's now an ensemble of decision trees uh, to allow our prediction. Uh, beyond some of those individual assets, we also are interested in looking at how we can couple these highway and railway systems. And the intermodal terminals or junctions are key uh, to this type of modeling. Um, we proposed a fault tree model in order to reflect some of the dependencies between components and subcomponents in these intermodal terminals um, and leverage either existing models uh, from the literature for some of those subcomponents or the models um, that we derived ourselves. But the idea is that now not only at the railway and highway system level, but also at that intermodal terminal, can we try to estimate the damage and post event functionality and how it evolves in time. We've been working with some colleagues um, to look at efficient ways to model some of these um, intermodal systems where perhaps we have a particular interest in looking at um, a hazard that affects, say, a community or regional scale. Um, but we recognize that the infrastructure is a part of a much broader uh, network that maybe go well beyond the region and even have a national or international reach in some cases. Uh, so in this case, we're leveraging multi-scale modeling of these intermodal networks where different layers either reflect different assets, whether it be highway or railway assets. And we have different levels of resolution depending on uh, the scale of interest. Per perhaps at the local scale, having a higher resolution model that includes all of the junctions and terminals uh, railway, highway components, including bridges and other nodes. But at the regional or um, national scale, just looking at key um, nodes, for example, at cities where we would have goods flowing, for example, from uh, the Northeast uh, down to Memphis, for example. So different levels of resolution and scale uh, in these intermodal uh, networks. An illustration at the right is just showing that kind of visually in our adjacency style matrix where all of those color coded boxes are where we have the links between our different scales. Uh, we've been working with the collaborator Andres Gonzalez uh, at Oklahoma State University to look at things like optimal recovery of these infrastructures. And I will say that this is not my forte or expertise in terms of looking at um, optimization, but it's been a lot of fun to work with Andres to look at how we can conceptualize uh, that infrastructure damage and recovery problem through this uh, lens of, of optimizing deployment of things like repair crews or repair resources after an event. Um, so Andres has been working with us to pose a mixed integer programming uh, approach for looking at optimizing um, this repair deployment where we're minimizing costs associated with the owner's cost or the shipper's cost and we're, in, we're posing constraints on this problem and that would be for example resource constraints um, or looking at constraints related to functionality or repair actions that may be taken on the system. And I want to show you the application to that Memphis or MMSA regional network. Uh, it has a little over 200 railway bridges and about 150 highway bridges, six intermodal terminals. Um, and we have both the um, bridge roadway network as well as the railway network with five class one railroads operating in this region. So it's a very important hub in terms of um, goods flow. Um, and also an interesting study from the perspective of looking at the potential for seismic damage where we're in this example simulating a magnitude 
event uh, very near that historical origin of the New Madrid event. So without um, belaboring a lot of the, the details of the application, I want to show you some of the, the byproducts or types of results that we can glean from coupling the models uh, through that resilience framework. So for example, uh, we can estimate the likelihood of damage or the likelihood of closure to different components within our system. And that's first what I'm showing you on this slide based on a, a Monte Carlo simulation of that regional intermodal uh, network, um, where on the left, we see the bridges, on the middle, we see the railways and roadways, and on the right, we see the intermodal terminals. And as I click, you can see in time, as we begin to restore or recover some of these assets, some of those reds turning to green in terms of probability, for example, of closure. Um, in this example, we actually have a pretty simple assumption. We're looking at a random assignment of restoration crews and not yet employing uh, some of those optimal decisions like on optimal recovery. But it does give us some initial insight into what's dictating the network functionality at different time points. Uh, we see that um, that initial loss of performance is primarily driven by damage to some of those intermodal terminals while the long-term loss of functionality is often dictated by bridges. For example, unseated spans that may take hundreds of days, in some cases, for fully uh, replaced structures. Um, that's just showing you at the component level, um, but we can look at uh, integrating these into a regional transportation network analysis, looking at freight flow, for example, through this intermodal system. Um, so I'm just showing a few examples of intermodal performance metrics on the top uh, showing the cost to the shipper as it evolves in time. Um, on the bottom showing the value of freight flow that's disrupted. So we might expect that over time uh, that disrupted flow of goods would reduce and the cost to shippers would reduce. But how can we integrate that perhaps um, into uh, kind of a comparative assessment we're using here a network functionality metric that's a ratio of post-event network throughput to pre-event network throughput. And this is adapted by some of the work that Miller Hooks proposed uh, almost a decade ago at this point. Um, looking at QT again as our functionality metric, um, our D sub K is that post-event network throughput um, with our Negative sign is indicating that pre-event network throughput uh, and V sub K is our value of goods uh, in a shipment. And we can weight these or use an impedance function based on different measures, um, for example, related to uh, cost of, or flow of goods. This slide just shows that same example of that scenario earthquake event, but again, propagating uncertainties in the intensity measure at the site the damage potential of the components in the intermodal network, uh, uncertainty, and the repair and restoration activities over time. And you can see how that plays out in terms of the temporal evolution of this particular uh, network functionality metric Q, which in this case I'm just showing is that cost to the, the shipper as one example. Um, you'll see some literature proposed looking at uh, indices or metrics that take some integral um, above or below this um, functionality curve, which is essentially what's shown on that right-hand side. Um, and while this type of information by itself um, may start to provide some initial insight into the impacts that one may see from a hazard event, um, perhaps one of the main intentions is to support different types of decision-making perhaps allowing comparative assessment of different pre-event investments like retrofit or upgrade, uh, or support things like post-event action where we deploy inspection crews or where we deploy our resources for repair and recovery. And that's where some of our ongoing work uh, is looking at some of that optimal restoration and looking at crew assignment and crew scheduling. So I'm showing one uh, kind of relatively simple example here where we're only looking at repairing bridges as one of the components in this broader intermodal system, but looking at how do we prioritize where we deploy our crews um, so that can, we can most optimally 
uh, restore um, shipments for 24 different shipments of goods between their origins and destinations. So I'll go back and try to show you that animation one more time. On the left, we see the crew assignment. If it's green, that's where the crew's at. And on the right, you're seeing um, the temporal evolution where we're starting to repair and open some of these structures. So just one example of the types of decisions that these models can help to support. I wanna spend the last bit of my time showing an example um, that perhaps a bit more broadly looks at transportation infrastructure and its role within broader community resilience modeling. And now I'll be shifting to the coast to Galveston, Texas, which is a barrier island not too far from Houston. Um, and it's subjected to these coastal multi-hazards that come with hurricanes, the surge, the wave, the wind, the rainfall. Um, and I want to acknowledge some of my collaborators who are noted in the paper at the bottom right from Texas A&M, from U.S. Naval Academy, and from Oregon State University, who are working together on what we refer to as the Galveston test bed um, in our NIST center. The overarching concept of some of the efforts within the NIST Center are looking at coupled systems modeling, particularly across physical, social, and economic systems. And I'll show you one snapshot here that looks at transportation networks, specifically surface transportation with bridge and roadway systems, um, as well as other physical assets like residential buildings and how they couple with some of the social systems modeling in the center, for example, looking at socio uh, demographics and social vulnerability content, along with um, human behavior models like uh, population evacuation that some of our colleagues are working on, and explore how these types of coupled systems modeling can provide us insight on what I'm referring to as these hybrid metrics of performance that require that coupling between physical and social systems. So as I move to the coast with the hurricane hazard potential, I'll um, highlight the potential for leveraging surrogate models in our multi-hazard modeling or characterization. So on the right, you're seeing an image um, of an ADSERC and SWAN uh, model of the entire um, Gulf Coast, uh, where some of our colleagues are using these very high fidelity models to simulate surge and wave and wind from storm events. Um, in our case, we wanted to be able to look at hundreds or thousands of simulations uh, of these storms for our risk-based resilience modeling. So we leveraged a Krieging surrogate model, so replaced that um, relatively costly um, storm simulation with an approximating model, in this case, a Krieging model, to allow us to estimate the joint hazard uh, at all of our infrastructure assets. For example, the surge height, the wave height, the wave period, the inundation duration um, that may be experienced during these storm events. Using predictors, for example, related to uh, the forward speed of the storm or the landfall location of the storm. And this isn't a, a completely new uh, concept, although we've applied it uh, perhaps in a different context to additional multi-hazards. Um, but some of the work by uh, Alex Teflonides and colleagues um, have put this forward in the literature as well. Um, we leverage those models alongside some of our coastal transportation uh, fragility models. For example, bridges, considering their vulnerability to span shifting or unseating from surge and wave loads, as illustrated on the top, or roads that may be subjected to these uh, long duration inundation events that lead to washout. And I will acknowledge that generally some of these coastal assets like our bridges typically are not designed to withstand the uplift forces from surge and wave action. So it should be no surprise to us that during these storm events, many of these low elevation structures, in fact, are not available to serve our transportation infrastructure and communities after these events. And those are the models that we're trying to provide within this context. Um, in this case, I'm just showing, again, the region of interest and our simple abstraction of the roadway network and bridges that were identified along the barrier island, and that helped to connect the barrier island to um, inland, as well as critical facilities like medical or fire 
um, and an initial illustration of the temporal evolution of performance, in this case, an all-to-all -all connectivity uh, in the region. But I want to um, highlight some of the, the different types of analyses that this can allow us to do, which might be useful to decision makers. For example, looking at the probability of disconnection of households from emergency services because of this bridge and roadway damage on the top, looking at a scenario storm event, but on the bottom uh, row, looking at that uncertainty and event occurrence and intensity. Um, so we can now estimate annual probability of disconnection of households from emergency services, whether it be fire or medical or connection from inland. So this may be uh, a good way to start to look at targeting resources or even communicating uh, with households that are in these darker red colors um, that they may be disconnected in the event uh, of a hurricane and it may prompt uh, perhaps more evacuation. Um, and that kind of evacuation behavior was a part of the question that we pursued with our colleagues is these hybrid uh, social and physical metrics. We're calling these hot households. And what this essentially means is that we have uh, fragility models for our residential structures, are they likely to be damaged? Um, from our social science colleagues, are we likely to have non-evacuees inside? And from our transportation resilience models, are they likely to be disconnected from emergency medical services? So this is really where we should be perhaps targeting our resources. People that didn't leave, that are in damaged houses that we can't get to uh, anymore. Um, and with that, um, I want to leave you with a few thoughts on some of the opportunities moving forward. In that last example, I just started to scratch the surface, uh, showing some coupling between um, our intermodal transportation modeling and things like social or economic systems. And I think um, while there's a lot of great work ongoing, including um, in, in centers like fMRI, I think we have a lot of opportunities moving forward to looking at tighter coupling um, and, and dynamic modeling between these um, distinct systems. Uh, on the left, um, some of our ongoing work is looking at some of the port uh, facilities and structures, um, but this is just one example of an existing gap that we have in terms of characterizing the physical vulnerability of our intermodal transportation infrastructure as well as better understanding the restoration of these assets. Um, some of our ongoing work is pushing this concept of smart resilience, looking at how we can leverage uh, technology and diverse data sources to better improve uh, these types of resilience models. And the context um, that Pranavesh uh, Panikal is working on is looking at situational awareness during flood events, and how we can leverage things like traffic cameras or crowdsource data, along with our physics based modeling to improve understanding of loss of connectivity or travel time immediately or, um, during and after a flood event. Um, and I finally want to um, encourage um, us to continue to embrace not only coordinated data collection, but also curation and publication across um, these different urban scales and systems. And I'll, I'll point to design safe cyber infrastructure that's funded by National Science Foundation as one example of a platform that we can uh, leverage. And this is an effort that I've been a part of for about six years now. Um, the idea is um, essentially a place to leverage high performance computing resources, cloud storage, but also publish and share data and models. And in fact, a lot of the work that I showed today has associated publications in Design Safe where we share, for example, our finite element models of our bridge structures used in fragility modeling or our survey data used in the repair modeling um, if you're interested in leveraging any of that um, type of information. And I think uh, through sharing, not only can we advance our field, but also support future data fusion efforts or use of AI or machine learning to inform resilience quantification. Um, I mentioned the NIST Center's efforts and a part of the product of that center is uh, NCORE, the Interdependent uh, Community Resilience Modeling Platform. And that's intended to ultimately be an open source code um, where 
the community or researchers can also contribute to as well as leverage the models and data that pro are provided in Inform. So I offer you the link here if you're interested in learning more. And with that, I want to go back to thanking my group and acknowledging some of our sponsors, and I'll be happy to take uh, questions if you have any. Hi, uh, Dr. Paget. This is Valentina Fakus, um, the Vice President for WTS at FAU. Um, so thank you so much for the insightful presentation. Uh, it was interesting to learn a little more about the seismic model uh, and also how to optimize the problems for the network. Um, so at this time, we'll be taking any questions and feel free to speak up or type it in the chat. It looks like we have one question here. Um, given that the public and government are more interested in social resilience, how do you properly integrate physical and community resilience models? Uh, and, and that is mentioned in slide 43. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you, John. Um, I, I think that that's a challenge that we often have as engineers to try to translate some of the physical impacts into meaningful um, metrics uh, and models uh, that are of use to the community. That's a really key effort um, that um, our, our NIST Center is trying to currently pursue. And my um, suggestions for that would be twofold. <laughs> One is uh, encouraging early engagement uh, with uh, communities on some of these types of activities. Um, and I, I can say that I am also guilty of not always doing that at the onset of projects. Um, and that's something that I think we're trying to do um, on the outset of many of our ongoing efforts is to be sure that we can tailor um, some of these models to inform metrics of interest, whether it be things like um, business disruptions um, or economic losses or starting to look at coupling understanding of socially vulnerable populations and whether or not we can actually get to those communities um, and looking at equitable impacts of some of these hazard events or some of the types of, uh, of things that we have started to look at more um, as we've heard more from the public or from agencies uh, that might try to leverage some of this data. Um, and so, um, I think tied to that is, is my second encouragement, which is not working in disciplinary isolation. Um, there's no way that, say, a structural engineer like myself uh, could work alone in this type of field. And so encouraging and supporting some of that type of interdisciplinary collaboration and convergent research, I think, is key to achieving that. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Padgett. So we have another question. Um, how do you how do you measure description descriptions cost to rail shippers? And this is in slide thirty two. Yeah. So on on um, some of the intermodal transportation modeling, um, we're trying to start to tie not only the volume of goods that's disrupted um, through the network, but also start that communication path towards um, perhaps meaningful um, input to users of these types of models. So you point out one of them, which would be, for example, disruption costs to rail shippers. And in that case, we're using a pretty simplified mapping between uh, either time delays in good shipment or increased travel distance in good shipment and using simple um, measures of cost per time delay or cost per detour length as one uh, example of those costs to shippers. Um, but there may be other types of costs. Of, and, and I will say in order to do that, we have to leverage um, data from the literature um, or from collaborators. And I probably could not off the top of my head, you know, point you to that number or that data, but I'd be happy to share with you the reference that we use there as well. Um, but there are different types of costs that I think we're in increasingly trying to look at making sure that our models can link up uh, and inform. And one example is working with some of our colleagues from economics who are looking at 
um, say community scale or regional scale CGE models. And from their perspective, they're very interested in the class of goods, the actual type of goods and the volume or dollar value of goods that's no longer flowing through a region. And that has direct links with some of their community scale economic impact modeling. Um, and so I think it's finding those intersections and making sure that we have those linkages that can inform some of that type of cost or economic impact model. But specifically on the, the source of that cost to shipper goods, if you would like to follow up with me and I can share um, some of our dollar estimates per detour length or for rerouter distance, I'd be happy to share that reference. We have There's some covers. Work. Yeah, you want to help me, Valentina, to read or pick one? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, how do you choose your metrics when elevating the resilience of multimodal transportation systems? Well, I would say it's twofold. <laughs> I will say one um, is that you know we we are not the the first researchers to this um, to this field. Um, and so there, there have been some really nice studies um, that have provide, provided um, essentially survey or state of the art reviews on transportation infrastructure resilience quantification and pointed to viable indicators of performance, whether it be things like travel time or travel delay or volume of goods disrupted, um, just as some examples. But I will say that we also um, are taking it, I'd say, from the reverse direction as well and working in uh, interdisciplinary centers like uh, the NIST Center. We need to make sure that our models and our output are meaningful to our colleagues who are looking at social or economic impacts. And so the, I gave the example of the CGE models. Um, they're very interested in things like uh, the NAICS class of goods that's disrupted because that directly informs some of their general equilibrium models looking at economic impacts. Um, so that's another kind of informant um, of the metrics that we assess. And the last one would be where we have established community partnerships understanding the types of questions that our stakeholders are interested in. Um, and the example perhaps that I'll give there would be some of the work uh, looking at situational awareness and flood impacts of transportation networks, um, where, for example, we've been working with stakeholders in Houston um, that are in the emergency response arena or for example, the Texas Medical Center who deploys vehicles after the event. And they raise questions that perhaps we wouldn't initially have looked at as metrics. One would be, for example, they're really interested in, is it safe to deploy their emergency vehicles? What, they have different waiting height vehicles. Um, and so um, what would be kind of their trigger for when they'd have to change to different vehicle types? And so they're very interested in flood depths and safe passage uh, of roadways. Whereas in other cases, they may be interested in travel time to different uh, critical facilities. So working directly with stakeholders for me has been very useful and insightful for driving those metrics too. Okay, it looks like we have two more questions. Um, have you had interest from private industry in conducting these assessments, maybe as a private uh, public partnership? So I will say that it's it's something that we certainly would be interested um, in doing more of, but we haven't had a lot of projects that are directly funded by private industry in this transportation resilience or intermodal transport resilience arena. Um, I certainly think there are opportunities uh, with respect to either public private partnerships on um, you know, our highway assets, but also with respect to some of the railway uh, systems where we've actually um, perhaps had some closer discussion or conversations is um, looking at things like in coastal industrial communities um, and looking at damage to some of these industrial complexes and whether or not perhaps we can um, 
have some of their emergency response crews reach um, their facilities in the aftermath of events. So I think that's kind of the range of different uh, options, but I wouldn't say that we've had a lot of direct funding from private industry as opposed to um, perhaps uh, partners or advisory committee members on, on some of our projects. Okay, last and final question. Um, USACE Waterborne Commerce Statistics Center publishes annual scale throughout throughput data for 150 top ports. Do you know if monthly throughput data is openly published anywhere? Hmm, that, that's a fair question. I would say that, that that's one of the things we're always challenged with as well is finding um, reputable and public information to inform some of our analyses. Um, I could certainly put you in touch with Annabelle Tafour, who is the PhD student in our group who's helping to lead some of the charge as we shift towards some of the port resilience modeling and coupling that as a part of our intermodal systems. Um, beyond some of the US uh, ACE statistics data, um, we've been leveraging other types of data from EIA, um, Energy uh, Institute or from um, Federal Highway and um, TRB, but I probably couldn't break it down for you as, as detailed as Anibal could. Um, so I'd be happy to connect you with him if you want to send me a follow-up note. 